Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. I want to read something from Isaiah chapter 1 to you and we're jumping right into our message. Isaiah chapter 1, it starts at verse 12. I believe it's on the screen for you today to, to follow along if you like. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feast and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the course of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing... That's our will, our choice, and obedient. You will eat the good things of the land, but if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Well, wow, pastor. Here we give you this warm welcome to the pulpit, and you throw this in our face. What's going on? Don't, 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 don't feel bad. If I'd have been sitting out there with you as a parishioner and the pastor read that scripture, I probably would have said the same thing. What? Is this how you start off a message? Hitting us in the face like this? Well, I'm not saying this is you, but this is God speaking at the beginning of Isaiah to Isaiah as a vision. And there was a particular reason why I wanted to read this passage at the beginning. This vision of Isaiah shows God's heart of pain because of the people of God's failures. Did you catch the wording where God says, I am burdened? And I am weary. He was burdened and wearied of their behavior. I want to point this out to you because we understand God is omnipotent, is all powerful, omniscient, all knowing, and He is sovereign and He is everywhere. He's everywhere. So we, we see this big, huge, wonderful, gracious loving, caring, awesome, boundless, limitless God. And we don't realize that inside of God, he carries the pain, the burden, and the weariness of the behavior of his people. You know why? Because God also has feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, we're made of intellect, will, and emotion. So is God. Where do you think that came from? Our intellect, our will, and emotion, the makeup of a personal being came from God. We are made in the likeness of God. And so we forget sometimes what God carries inside of his being for us. Was there some strong wording here? Yes. Did he say what he hated? Yes. Can we see a smidgen of the, the anger of God because of the righteousness of God, because of the justice of God? Can we see a little bit of that rise up inside of him? Yes. But at the same time, we see the hurt, the pain, the weariness that he's carrying 
Why? Why did he talk so strongly to them through Isaiah? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. That's why he was being hard with them, because he loved them. Not because he was just angry, because he loved them. Not because he was just, he was showing his true feelings for them. God cares. So I decided to ask my wife, first part of last week, a week ago, I said, so I'm going to put my wife to the test. I said, hon, what is the greatest sin? I no more got it out of my mouth, and she said, rejecting Christ. Hmm. I didn't fool her. She's right. That is the greatest sin because the ultimate rejection of Christ brings about eternal damnation in hell someday. Straightforward, plain talk from God's word. So I said, well, I'll get her on this one. I really thought I'd get her. I said, what is the second greatest sin? And I thought I had her. I no more said, and she said, disobedience. I thought, rats, she got it right again. And she was right. Those, and I said, spot on, babe. That's exactly what I feel. And I just tested her to see what she would say. And she said, yeah, sin is the greatest rejection, or rejecting Christ is the greatest sin. And the, the, the greatest, or the second greatest sin would be disobedience. Uh, refusal, in other words, refusal and neglect to obey. That's what it simply means. Look it up. To simply refuse or neglect to obey is disobedience. It's the, the most severe kind of rut. We've been talking about ruts. It's the most severe kind of rut we can be in. Now, Pastor Ryan was saying how spiritual, our spiritual condition is the most serious rut. And he's correct. That, that doesn't go against this saying that the, the, this most severe kind of rut can be sin because the, the fact that our spirituality is affected, what's it affected by? It would be affected by sin that's being committed. So they, they work collectively together. They co coexist together. That sin affects our spirituality one way or the other. No, if we're not sinning, that strengthens our spirituality in Christ. If we are sinning, that's affecting our spirituality in Christ. No one put us there, though. Here's the thing to realize today. No one put us in a sin rut but our own choice. Nobody can make me. Nobody can affect me that way. If, if I'm in a sin rut today, it's because of my choice. And we can prove that all the way back in the garden when Adam and Eve were considered perfect beings, not absolute perfection like God, but they were considered as perfect in nature, perfect beings, because there had been no sin in, in existing yet. But God gave them the uh, power of choice, and they happened to make the wrong choice one day. They can't blame anybody. When Adam said to God, that woman you gave me, God, that's what he said. That woman you gave me. So wait a minute, Adam, are you blaming God for the woman he gave you? You can't blame Eve. You can't blame God. You blame yourself because you chose to eat of the fruit. Our choices, ladies and gentlemen, is what puts us into the rut of sin. The most dangerous kind of rut we can be in because it affects our spirituality as a Christian. Something is happening today that happened in Isaiah's day. In Isaiah 24, 5, it says, the earth is defiled by its people. Ladies and gentlemen, the earth is defiled by its people. Not things, not stuff, but by the people. Goes back to choice. Goes back to our will. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, which means mandates, rules, guidelines, and broken the everlasting covenant, which is this today. That's what this is. It's a covenant that God made with mankind. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant that was made. I want to read another passage of scripture to bring this into today's light 
because I think it will help bring a, a series of events that took place from the time that I, this, or some of the events that took place when Isaiah said this, to show you it brings us right to a current day. And that was in Luke chapter 17, verse 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. That brings it right up to the day of Jesus saying this. People were eating, drinking, and marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, my wife made a comment to me when she was looking over my notes to put them online for you. She took my notes and got them ready for online for after sermon notes. And she was saying something to the effect, wow, if he did that then, how bad were those people? He, he destroyed the earth. He, took, he destroyed everyone but for eight people on the ark. How bad things must have really been. And, and, and you know what? When you look at today, there is another judgment coming because it's that bad. Isn't it? If you read Revelations, it's on its way. It was the same days of the Lord. People were eating and drinking and buying and selling, planting and building but the day of Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained. Wait, but the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is in the housetop with possessions inside shall go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field shall go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife? Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. Now, I'm going to read, I'm going to read two more verses were the two verses that when I was five years old, I took my parents' hands on either side of me and I said, I want to get saved. And we walked down to the altar of a service we were attending and I gave my heart to Jesus because the pastor read these two verses in the pulpit. These were the two verses that brought me to Jesus. Now, all the other work that Jesus did before I was five years old was all part of it, but these were the two verses that got me to the altar. Here they are. I tell you on that night, two people will be in bed and one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. And I said to God, and I said to my parents, I don't want to be the one left behind. And so they walked me to the altar, and at the age of five, I gave my heart to the Lord. And don't misunderstand, over the years, I would rededicate. Absolutely, as I grew up in the Lord, I had to learn to grow in the Lord. And you would rededicate. So if, and, and this is a point you must grasp today. If I knowingly, please say knowingly with me, knowingly, walk in discipline. Please understand, there's a difference between walking knowingly as opposed to walking with struggle in your life where you're trying to overcome. There's a difference. There's a difference. When we're struggling with something and we're trying our best to overcome it, as opposed to when I knowingly walk in disobedience I'm walking to my own demise for judgment day. I'm walking in my own demise because I knowingly am walking in disobedience as opposed to I'm just struggling with trying to be a better Christian. Knowingly sinning will disbar me from heaven. Make no mistake about it. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. Knowing sinning will disbar me from heaven. We can't walk out of here and sin as we please and think we can walk into heaven. There we have a, we, while we have a loving, caring God, we have a just God. And he can't permit sin in heaven. There will be no sin in heaven. Walking in disobedience, walking in obedience and brokenness and sorrowfulness as I, uh, Psalms 34, 18 says, uh, it will be my entrance into heaven. I will be entering heaven by walking in brokenness and sorrowness, sorrowfulness. Falling into a sin rut is our own issue we need to deal with. How, how does this happen, Pastor? How do we, how do we f slip into a rut of disobedience and and, and, and how, how does this, why does this happen? How does it continue to be a struggle? Well, one way, ladies and gentlemen, is, and there's so much more that can be said, but time-wise, 
by becoming desensitized to the Holy Spirit. See, here's the danger of walking in disobedience. If we continue to walk in, and I have a chart to explain this better at the end. When we walk in disobedience, we're not walking obediently with what we know we should be doing. Uh, when do we recognize the Holy Spirit trying to speak to us to do something to change us? Because if I become desensitized by my actions and my choices that aren't appropriate before the Lord, that, that, don't, that doesn't strengthen my walk with the Lord, then it's going to impair my ability to hear or to respond effectively to the voice of the Lord. When he puts a little tap on the shoulder and says, uh-uh, but I don't hear it, I don't feel the way I should, and I go on and do it anyways because I've become something. And I'll explain that as we move along. What has happened? What has happened is that if we live in this desensitization of the Holy Spirit speaking to us, we aren't recognized because we're, we're not walking the way we should, it develops what we call a lifestyle of disobedience. My lifestyle becomes one of disobedience. It has become my daily norm. I think nothing of it. I no longer think nothing of it because I've become desensitized to the Spirit's voice. Which means we have become comfortable. Say comfortable. We have become comfortable in our disobedience as a lifestyle. Not only becomes the lifestyle, but now it's, be, I've, it's become comfortable to be in this disobedience, in this lifestyle, because I'm desensitized to the Spirit, because I've departed from His presence so much, I'm not hearing what He's saying. Now we're not done yet, because here's the scariest part of that. You ready? We are now saying, because I'm being desensitized, because I'm being in disobedience, because that's become my lifestyle and daily norm, that we are now saying what is right and what is wrong for my life, and not God. I am now saying that the way I live is my choice. That it really doesn't matter how God sees it, how God feels about it. It doesn't matter if he's weary with it or burdened with it or whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is how I feel. And there cannot be a more dangerous rut to be in than to think that we know better than God. Ladies and gentlemen, get out of the rut before Jesus comes. If that's us, we're in trouble. And I believe that we need to remember that mom and dad, and grandparents, we are examples to our children and those around us in the workplace, et cetera, our neighbors, et cetera. Do you know that in the Old Testament, even among God's people, there would be times that they would murder their sons and daughters for reasons of worship and burn their sons? And in, in, in 2 Kings, uh, in the book of uh, Kings, the kings of Judah, of Judah, God's people, would burn their sons. Now, I know today that we're not going to go home and put our kids on the pile of woods and light a fire. But, say but, but, I'm going to challenge you a little bit. Are we sacrificing our sons and daughters and grandkids to technology, to, the, to, to Facebook and to TikTok. The only TikTok I want is my watch going TikTok, TikTok. <laughs> and through social media. Ladies and gentlemen, when you're in bed, what are your children watching and listening to at night? On technology. What about their friends? Do you know that when we would meet our kids' friends, they always put on the best appearance, of course. But what are their friends like when they're not with you, and, but they're with your children, grandchildren? What do their friends stand for? What do their friends believe? Do their friends ever talk about God? What about their views? The views of their friends. What about your children's views? Here you are in church, hopefully raising your children, hopefully your grandchildren, and hopefully all of them are in church. 
But what, is, what are the practices of their friends? What are the practices of your children when you're not around? When I was pastoring, uh, near the end of my pastorship here, there was a family who had come to see me on a Thursday night. And they said, Pastor, we need to talk to you about something. We're very troubled about something. I said, what's up? Our 16-year-old daughter has just recently told us that she's now atheist. Raised in church. It's okay. Give her some things. Give them some books, some guidance to think about. One week later, another couple comes to see me. I said, Pastor, we have some troubling news. These couples didn't know each other. I said, what's up? Our daughter, 16 years old, just informed us she's atheist. Now, a girl raised in church. Now, keep in mind that in both of these families, the girls said other things that they were into that I can't say in the pulpit. Don't want to say in the pulpit. At that time, there was a statistic happened to be going around, around that time, maybe a little bit after, that there are 63 million teenagers in America. Now, this is a couple years ago, two years ago, so maybe, I don't know what that number is now. But at that time, 38% of these teenagers believed they were atheists. 38% of 63 million. That's a lot of young people growing up in our society to become our leaders someday. 38%. Where did that come from? Well, it came from the ideologies of our day. It came from humanism, from secularism. It came from the media, friends, social media, etc. Now, here's another concern. What is the music messaging going on in your children today? What are the messages they're getting in the music they listen to? When they got those headsets on and they're listening away, what are they listening to? Do you know? I remember a family one time, they're probably here today, who told me years ago that they decided to listen to their son's CDs just to see what they're listening to. And they found out they had the Christian CDs they, and they had taped secular bad music on top of those Christian tapes. So when they thought that he was listening to Christian music, he was listening to worldly music. What music are your children and what messages are they getting in the music today? What about the attentiveness? Get into the life of your child to know them. The lethargicness, the complacency. Our children, our grandchildren, listen to me. Our children are watching and they are listening to us. Parents and grandparents. They're watching, they're listening, and we are forming their idea of God. We're forming their ideal of Christianity. We're forming their ideal and beliefs and views and belief system of what they think and who they think God is and how he works. Based on our example, ladies and gentlemen. So I've taken Pastor Ryan to Polytech one morning to high school. And we are in the car. We go behind the scooter, drop him off. There's a long line of cars. The state troopers are there. And uh, I knew I was in trouble. I knew exactly what they were doing. And daddy was going to get burnt. I hadn't put my seatbelt on yet. It was at that time when the law was becoming a law in Delaware to wear seatbelts. And there would be times I didn't. There were times I would. But when it became a law, I had to get used to it. It's always now. And so I uh, pulled up and I saw I had plenty of time to put my seatbelt on. So I wouldn't get caught. But guess what? I didn't because there was another law that was more important than the law of the land. And that was the law of obedience. And I knew that if I put my seatbelt on and Pastor Ryan saw that I did that so I wouldn't get caught, I was teaching him that it's okay to break the law, but at the last second, if you have a chance, don't break it. But until then, you can break the law. So I said to myself before the Lord, Lord, I don't know if I pray, but in my thinking, I'm in trouble, and I'm going to get a tongue lashing. I drove up. The, the state trooper, very diplomatic, by the way, outstanding, outstanding attitude, but he was firm. Sir, why isn't your seatbelt on? What kind of example are you to your son who's got a seatbelt on? From now on, you need to wear your seatbelt to be a good example to your son. I said, yes, sir, you're right. I took it on the chin so that my son would know that the law of obedience is better 
than the law of the land. Because to obey those who are over you is a biblical principle. That's obedience to a biblical principle. It's a biblical principle. And so I, I, I took time to write the, the state trooper, uh, Troop 3, a, a thank you card. <laughs> thank you for balling me out. I did. And I want to thank you for doing your job, and I will make sure I, I do better as a dad. Thank you for the, for the rebuke. And I sent that off to them. Now, I want us to take a look at what we call common disobedience and spiritual disobedience. Two different lists. This is a practical list. This kind of sums up everything I'm trying to get across today. Number one, texting while driving. There's a good possibility that in the common disobedient lane, lane, that when you're driving down the road and somebody's got their eyes buried in their lap, you pretty much can know they're doing something like that. Maybe they're talking the phone, they're texting, they're doing, maybe they're reading the mail. I used to read the mail, go down the road at a light, but now I'm afraid to drop my eyes, they'll think I have a phone in my hand. And uh, so texting while driving, stopping at a stop sign. What are you supposed to do when there's absolutely not a soul around? There ain't a car in any four directions. No way. And you're supposed to stop? Can I just slip through that? No one's watching. Yes, they are. The one who carries our burden and fills the weariness inside of our behavior. God is carrying that. He sees it. Stopping at stop signs, red lights. Oh, my goodness. I can make the Troop 3 rich. Just go up here at the Dairy Queen light and set all day, and you'll make so much money you won't know what to do with it. Because those lights, when they turn red, it doesn't mean a thing to people in Delaware. You got a green light, you're trying to go because you're going to get a, a, a red light soon if you don't get going, and three or four other cars are going through a distinct red light. You see the red, and there they go, one after the other. You could get rich at Troop 3 at Dairy Queen. You have money to get an ice cream afterwards. Turning on a blinking red light. Last night I was coming home and I saw a car just breeze right through that. Light. That wasn't green. You got to stop. Stop for one blink and take off. I know. I know why you don't do it. Because as soon as you stop on the red blinking light, it turns red and you got to wait for the whole light. And by the way, I've had that happen to me so many times. I had to stop and there was no cars crossing the road. They just decided to chase the light. Why? Do you change when there's no one there? You're holding us up. One night I'm going home in the dark and there's one car behind me. There's nobody around here. Turn on roll, Old Mill Road to go to Eagle's Nest. And I decide I better stop. There's one car. I don't know who it is. He went by. It was a state trooper. So, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and then, of course, they're speeding. And, and you're, you know, I'm a, I got stopped one time. The officer said, if you've been going 10 miles over, we don't bother you. But... You were going 15 miles over, I got to give you a ticket. I said, I'm so sorry, man. Then I find out if I'd have told him who I knew, he said, I wouldn't have given you a ticket if you had told me you knew my brother. But now I still got to give you a ticket because I stopped you. Well, you know what I was doing when I was speeding? I, I was daydreaming about the marriage retreat we were having. I was worrying over the notes in my head, and I wasn't paying attention to my speed. That was about 15 years ago. Little white lies, they don't exist. Why do you make them up? There's no scripture in the Bible that says, thou shalt not little white lie. It says, thou shalt not lie. How about tax returns? You know what? That's not that much money. They don't need to know about it. My wife is one stickler. Oh, my goodness. Everything I breathed about money, she, she, she notes it all. We paid a hefty amount this year. But let me tell you something. That girl covers it all. There ain't, there ain't no missing anything in our house. Do you know what they did one year at State of Delaware? They, they questioned our tithing and our medical because they were so high. When they got done sending us a report, my wife was able to send back more proof, and we got more money back. <laughs> That's what you get when you mess with God's people. Our tithe record was accurate, and our medical, we even found more. Wasn't it, baby? I think you found more in the medical. And so we, we got what we were supposed to get. Taxes. God sees it, though. That's not a burden and a weariness we need to put on him. And then here's one. As a little kid, I had to learn you can't take a grape in the grocery store and eat it going shopping. Did you ever see people just test, taste the food in the, that area of the store? And uh, uh, 
or eat half the grapes before they're weighed to pay for them at the counter. Years ago, we had to weigh them. You did. You have to weigh them. You can't eat half the grapes and have to pay less. You, gotta, you can't eat any grapes because every little ounce, you have to pay for that. We wouldn't let our kids play cereal box games. Remember that, babe? We wouldn't let them play cereal box games because we was afraid it would teach them to do lottery when they got older. So we refused these scratch-off games with our kids when they were little. I think we tried one or two and thought, nah, this ain't going to work. I don't like the education that's put in our kids' minds at a young age. What about what they see in television and, and, and the things that are read? We, we can't justify certain things just because we're adults. Well, because I'm an adult, I can handle it. No, you can't. If you're an adult and you're doing it, it's called sin. If it's inappropriate, it's called sin. Now, what does this list say to us? It says, we've come from a common disobedience that if we live this way, we've produced what we call now a comfortable disobedience. What becomes common to us becomes comfortable to us. Not good. If it's in this type of a category, we cannot become comfortable in disobedience because that says it's a lifestyle and it says, I know better than God. Or oh, I know better than the laws of the land. Now, I'm not going to obey the laws of the land if it goes against my Christian conviction. I'm going to take it on the chin if it's for Christ. But if it's not that type of law, we need to learn to come under the law. So that we learned what we call a better spiritual discipline, the discipline of spirituality. A discipline of walking with God, doing the way God would have us to do it. Become disciplined and comfortable in that. One person said to me years and years ago, I was in high school, the, the, mo the, the, the most comfortable that... The most comfort we should have is an uncomfortable comfort. The most comfort we should have should be in the uncomfortable, to be uncomfortable, to be comfort in uncomfortableness. In other words, never become comfortable in the wrong thing, they told us. So we have spiritual disobedience, and I know I got to hurry. Spiritual disobedience, which is a lack of prayer. And there's a scripture verse, this should be online, you can compare them. Lack of prayer, Bible reading, tithing, witnessing, uh, serving, uh, lack of uh, praise and worship, uh, lack of doing good and sharing with others, lack of kindness, compassion, forgiveness. And there's a scripture to counteract each one of those that says the spiritual discipline would be these things that's in the scripture. That is obedient. We should be obedient to those things. And ladies and gentlemen, if we're being disobedient in any of these categories and the many, many, many others the scripture says, then we've become comfortable in our disobedience. Spiritually, not just in common day, but in spiritual things, we've become comfortable. And I put sin up there because it's the negative, but what does James 4 say? He that knoweth to do good, to do good and doeth it not, to him it is. Okay, this side is very knowledgeable. What happened over here? Are you, this must be the spiritual side today? No, just kidding. Let, let's say this again. Let's see if we can all get it together. He that knows to do good and doeth not to him, it is sin. Absolutely right. That word sin there in the Greek means missing the mark, means missing the bullseye. God wants us to walk out here today, ladies and gentlemen. He wants us to hit the bullseye. He doesn't want us to miss the mark. He wants us to be on the mark so that when the day of judgment comes, we get to enter into heaven and he can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy. Enter into my joy. Yeah. So let me sum it up before we pray. If we are going to experience revival, we will need a revival. First, and when we walk in the Bible, we will experience revival personally. And when we all, say all, all walk in personal revival, we will walk in a corporate revival. And ladies and gentlemen, when we walk in a corporate revival, it will be said of our church and churches that do this in the book of Acts, and here come those that turn the world upside down, it was said. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the greatest reward that can be given to any church is for the, it to be said one day, here come those who turn this world, this town, this community upside down for Jesus Christ. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we could turn Dover and all of the communities around us in our state. In fact, if we're going to be the first state, why not become the first state revival that sweeps this country once and for all because we walk in obedience to his word. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a daily, daily, daily discipline. Now, someone said recently, if your Bible is worn your life won't be torn. Now that doesn't mean you won't go through things, but honey, when you walk according to the word, it will strengthen you, it will guide you, it will help you, it will make you a better person. So I have three takeaways and we're gonna pray. Takeaway number one, it said in Isaiah one, stop doing wrong, learn to do right. As simple as can be. I can't make it any simpler than that. Stop doing wrong, learn to do right. And by the way, we learn through this. Covenant, the word. Number two, submit your will to the word of God. We read it to you already in verse 19. If you are willing and obedient, say obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. And then lastly, God's word has all we need for life and godliness. That's also in Peter. But let me give it to you. Do what it says, but let me give, do what it, do, and therefore do what it says, but let me give it to you, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. My wife brought this one to my attention. Work hard to show the results. See, it's work. No question about it. We, God doesn't need lazy Christians. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. It's time to take the weariness and the burden off the heart of God today and put a joy and satisfaction in his heart because we are walking with deep reverence and fear before God. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Isn't that beautiful? There's not a better thing we can do to walk out here today than to please the Lord. So we're going to stand and we're going to ask that you open your heart. We're, we're done. we got two minutes and we're done. We know this is a busy day. You, many of you got plans to get to the base, et cetera. And you do want to eat. Have, is your life filled with common disobedience that's become comfortable? Has your life become spiritually disobedient and you've become comfortable? in that lifestyle. We now know it doesn't please God. So the whole place, as Pastor Ryan said last Sunday, was so beautifully said, the whole sanctuary is, a, is an altar. So we're not going to call you forward. We're going to call you to the Lord where you're standing. And if there is in any way, shape, or form that you know there's any common disobedience, you know you've been careless. If I know I've been careless... We need to give that to the Lord today. If in my spiritual walk, I'm being careless. I, I, I got to admit, Pastor, I've, I've been out of sync, out of, you know, I've been out of, I've been out of it. It's time to get out of the rut of disobedience because disobedience is a sin. And we don't want any sin when we stand before God at judgment day. Now, he knows we're not perfect. He knows we make mistakes. He knows we'll fail. But the Bible says, and he does tell us this, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So right now, we're going to have you do that as I pray. I want you to pray if there's an area of your life that you need to confess, confess it. That's between you and God. That's none of our business. That's between you and God. At the same time, if anyone here doesn't know the Lord or online, you don't know the Lord as your Savior, I'm going to also preface a prayer that will help you to accept Christ. Give your life to the Lord so you can come out of that disobedient state in nature you're in and become obedient to Christ and know him. So let's, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, you're very much aware of who's here today and who's listening. You know who you're speaking to, and they know they've been spoken to today by your word. So now it becomes a time that Adam and Eve had, we have, that is, we have to make a choice. And we have to choose to come out of our comfortableness of our lifestyle if it's not pleasing to you and come into your lifestyle 
And you admit it's hard work, but it's the right work and the way to go to bring the strength and spirituality that we need to stay out of ruts so we can experience revival in our lives. So Lord, today, whatever might be being confessed here, hear their prayers, O Lord, and forgive and help them to reverse those processes and me as well, to reverse these processes that keeps us in the wrong lane and puts us in the right direction. And we pray today, Lord, that those online or those here that would say, Jesus, here I am. I'm not, I'm not in good shape. And if you came today, I would not be ready for heaven. I would have to hear the words, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so I ask you, Lord Jesus, to help me, Father. And I open my heart to you. And right now, Lord, I'm praying, forgive me my sins and accept me in to your heart as I accept you in my heart today. Thank you for forgiving me, Lord. Help me to walk obediently. Now, Lord, I commit this congregation to you that we will go out and turn this community upside down for your kingdom. We choose to walk in obedience. And all God's people prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. God bless you. 